All right, here we are to read Crispin Cross of Lead, chapters 5 and 6. In 3 and 4, we learned a lot of description about his village of Stromford and what it was like. And sometime you might want to take a look at a, a medieval village, and you'll find a bunch of similar things. Found out that the village was controlled by Lord Furnival's steward, steward's a caretaker, John Acliffe. And all of the people that lived in the village were responsible to the lord of the village, he gave them permission for everything, and they could do really nothing on their own. So they really didn't have the freedoms that we enjoy for certain. Here we go, chapters 5 and 6. As I gazed from the high rock, high rock all seemed complete, completely normal. Men, women, and children were in their fields at their lawful labor, plowing, weeding, sowing, and where they would remain till dusk. But as I watched, I saw two horses with riders emerge from the manor house, by the way, one of the riders sat, not well. I was sure it was John Acliffe, the steward. The other man, I supposed, was the one I'd seen with him the night before. The two rode slowly to the church, dismounted, then went inside. I waited. The church bell began to ring. It was not the slow, rhythmic pealing that announced the canonical hours, but a strident, urgent clamor, a call to important news. In the fields, people stopped their work and looked about. Within moments, they began to walk toward the church. Others emerged from cottages. It did not take long before the entire village was assembled in front of the church porch. Once all had gathered, the bell ceased to ring. The men stepped from the church. The first to come was the steward, then the stranger. The last was Father Quinnell, whom I recognized because old age had marked him with a stoop. The trio placed themselves before the doors of the church, where the steward briefly addressed the crowd. Then the stranger held forth at greater length. Finally, Father Quinnell spoke. Then, followed by the steward and the stranger, as well as all the villagers, he led the way back into the church. The church bell now began to toll again, as if mass were being announced. But for whom or what purpose, I could not guess. I was tempted to go forward. But my apprehension, greatly increased by the destruction of my home, kept me back. Instead, I bowed my head in prayer. O oh, great and giving Jesus, I who have no name, who am nothing, who does not know what to do, who is all alone in thy world, I who am full of sin, I implore thy blessed help, or I am undone. Chapter 6 in time, people emerged from the church. Most went their several ways, some back to the fields, others to their cottages. Others remained in groups, gossiping, or so I supposed. I'd have given much to hear their words. As for the steward and the stranger, they remounted their horses and retreated to the manor house. Some of the village men went along. Once more, I had to decide what to do. I thought of going to the village for help. But there was only one person whom I could trust, Father Quinnell. Had not my mother trusted him? Had not he alone in the village treated me with some kindness? Even as I decided to speak to him, I saw the steward and the bailiff emerge from the manor house, along with the men of the village. They were armed with glaives, long poles with sharp blades attached, as well as bows. I even saw a long bow. Just to see them made me know my worst fears had come true. A hue and cry had been raised against me. Clinging to the rock, I watched the search party for as long as I was able. But when they became hidden by the forest cover, it was time for me to flee. My visit to the priest would have to wait until the night. Chapter 7 My day was spent in a hiding game. Even though I was hunted in many places, the merciful saints were kind. I was not caught. The searchers did come close. Once, twice, I could have touched their garments as they passed. On one such occasion, I learned enough to confirm my worst suspicions. It fell out this way. Late in the day, I had climbed into a great oak, so thick with leaves it hid me completely. Below, passing, then pausing, were two men, Matthew was a stout, honest fellow, known for his skill with the glaive. Luke was a small, wiry man, considered Stromford's finest archer. Both men lived near the mill. 
Pausing beneath the tree in which I hid, I heard Matthew say, Well, I don't think we'll find the boy. He'll have gone leagues by now. Then Matthew, shaking his head, said, But there's a, there's a kind of lo- strength in lunacy. I've seen it before, and the steward says it was madness over his mother's death that caused the boy to break into the manor and steal his money. When I, in my perch, heard these words, I could hardly believe them. I was being accused of a theft I had not done. Well, so it said, Luke replied, but not, I thought, with much conviction. For a moment, neither of them spoke. Then Matthew, in a low, cautious voice, said, If you believe it, do you? I held my breath as Luke took his time to answer. Then he said, Do I think that Ace's boy, a a boy of 13 who's as skittish as a new chick, entered the steward's home, broke into the money chest, and ran off into the forest? Ah, Matthew, I'm sure marvelous things happen in this world. I've seen a few of them myself, but no, by the true cross. I don't believe he did such a thing. Well, nor do I, said Matthew with greater strength. But the steward says it so. And that's the end of it, Luke added with a sigh. Then they spoke bitterly of the things the steward had done, how he had increased their labors, imposed countless fines, taken many taxes, increased punishments, and all in all limited their ancient freedoms by being a tyrant in the name of Lord Furnival. Luke spat upon the ground and said, He's no kin of Lord Furnival, only of his wife. To which Matthew added, God grant our Lord long life so that he may visit us soon, and we might put our petitions before him. Both men crossed themselves. Having spoken, they drifted off. I'd listened to such talk before, but always whispered. People often complained about their lives, taxes, work, and fees. Indeed, there had been so much talk that the steward, who must have heard of it, called a moot and informed one and all that such speech went against the will of God, our king and our master, Lord Furnival, that henceforward he would treat all such talk as treason, a hanging offense. Knowing these things could not be changed, despite the words of men like Matthew and Luke, I cared little for such matters. But in learning that I was being blamed for a crime I had not done, my incomprehension as to my plight only grew. The rest of the day I spent hiding, not even daring, despite my hunger, to search for food. Instead, I waited for darkness, past vespers and beyond, choosing not to stir until I heard the church bell ring the last prayers of the night, compline. Still, I held back for fear of being seen. But once the day was truly over, when the curfew bell had rung and all lay still as stone, I crawled from my hiding place. The night was intensely dark. Low clouds hid the moon and stars. The air was calm though animals' slops and whiffs of burning wood made it rank. No lights came from the village, but some gleamed in the manor house. Only then did I creep toward the church, alone, uncertain, and very full of fear. All right, we'll see you back here for chapter 8.